beginning. Steps one through four, the 3D subduction zone. I'm gonna skip step one because it's sort of quite trivial um, and it's discussed quite thoroughly in the manual. That's step one, it's axial compression. Um, there's no fault, simple roller boundary conditions. Step two, and it's a static problem. Step two is a visco, which we'll discuss first, is visco relaxation from Cosmi seismic slip on the central fault patch on the subduction interface. Uh, then we'll discuss inner seismic deformation with prescribed creep, uh, maintaining the viscoelastic materials. And step four, uh, we'll sort of combine the co-seismic part and the inner seismic part to do a couple earthquake cycles with prescribed slip. Um, and we'll have uh, a couple earthquake ruptures on the subduction interface as well as an earthquake on the splay fault. So this is our... Uh, so the geometry and problem description for step two. So using that central fault patch that we created in the mesh, we're gonna prescribe uniform slip on that fault patch. Um, and so, uh, and we will use viscoelastic properties in the subducting slab, um, uh, particularly with a depth dependent viscosity, as well as in the mantle, we'll put in a depth dependent viscosities the wedge and uh, crust will be um, elastic. So with that, looking at this diagram, keep that in mind. Questions, how do we want, to mo how do we want the model to behave on the boundaries? Anyone want to volunteer a guess? That's a good, let's start there. <laughs> so we have truncated our model along these lateral edges and the bottom. What do we want to have happen on the, what, maybe we should start with the top surface. What do we expect to happen at the top surface? Louder? Free surface, okay. In finite elements, we do not need to do anything to a surface that, has, that is a free surface. So top surface, no boundary condition. How about the lateral sides? What, what do we expect to happen to the displacement field as you get near the boundaries? We're having just, uh, so we have the only sort of source of deformation is uniform slip on the central patch. Okay, go to zero or absorbed. So how do we make displacements go to zero on a boundary? Dirichlet boundary conditions. Okay, we expect the displacements to go to zero as the distances increase. We might have some tangential motion on the boundaries. You'll notice that you know, if we, have, if we were to put a huge amount of fault slip here, we might have some lateral deformation along in that direction. Um, but we expect the motion, particularly in the perpendicular direction to the boundaries, to be uh, smaller than tangential motion. So what we're going to do is we're going to impose zero displacements perpendicular to the boundary on the lateral edges as well as the bottom. So we have our Dirichlet boundary conditions on how many sides? Six minus one is five. So five boundaries. Well, I just answered the question. <laughs> so the east, west, north, south, and bottom. How many materials do we need? What, should, what do we need? To, for, even a better question is, how many material blocks did we create in our mesh? Four. Four. So how many materials do we need in pilot? Four. Even if they are all elastic, even if we use the same type of material, if we created four material blocks in our mesh, we need four material models in Pyleth. So we'll have the sl slab, mantle, crust, and wedge. And I already said, which materials are we gonna make viscoelastic? We'll make, we'll make for the mantle and slab, we'll have a linear Maxwell model with a depth dependent viscosity. And then for the crust and wedge, we'll do an elastic material. 
How many faults do we need? We're having uniform slip on a single patch. One. <laughs> what type of slip type function should we use? So we're going to, we want to impose this co-seismic slip at a single time step. So what type of uh, time function should we use if we want to impose a sudden increase in slip? A delta function would give us slip at a single time step and no slip after that. Heavy set time function, yes. Actually, Pilot does not even have a delta function for slip because it's, it's never really used in a practical problem. So we have a step time function and uh, we're gonna impose it at 10 years. So not right at zero, we're gonna let the model do whatever it wants for zero to 10 years, 10 years will impose the fault slip. Okay, we're gonna have a viscoelastic material. We have an earthquake at 10 years. What might we wanna consider in terms of the duration of the, of the simulation that we wanna model? How long would we expect deformation to occur uh, in this domain? Is it going to all be over at 10 years? Will it linger? OK, we have someone saying it's strained by viscosity. Linear Maxwell model has viscosity, which also has a Maxwell time. So 200 years, roughly equal on the maximal time that you know generally in a real post seismic relax you would want to do multiple relaxation times to really see the stresses decrease or, or it could be in some cases if you have only 10 years of data and you see a viscoelastic response 10 years so it depends on what whether you want to actually see and predict the future or whether you're actually trying to match specific data what what should we use for a time step Mesh size. Uh, so we're going to use implicit time stepping. Um, we're not going to do dynamics. We don't care about the seismic waves in this case. So an implicit time stepping, every single time step uh, is basically a central independent static simulation with sort of the stress field carried over. So mesh size and time step are completely independent. Deformation rate. Okay, the rate of deformation in a viscoelastic model may be related to the Maxwell time. So we'll use 10 years, which is about five to 10% of the Maxwell time. That'll give us, you know, at least five to 10 points uh, per Maxwell time resolution of the viscoelastic relaxation. And our Dirichlet boundary conditions did not impose any time dependence, so we don't need to worry about uh, something on the boundary occurring at a shorter time scale um, than, uh, than the viscoelastic deformation. Okay, so next I'm going to go through several uh, .cfg files. Um, and then uh, in, this, this, in this case, I will go over all the .cfg files that are used in the simulation. Um, and then, uh, then we'll run the simulation as it's shown. Um, so first off, the pilothapp.cfg file, every single pilot simulation looks for a pilothapp.cfg file in the directory that pilot has run. And so this is where, in this case, we have uh, eight different examples, actually more because it's, uh, step eight has an A, B, and C. So we have a bunch of simulations that use the same mesh. And so we will put all the parameters that are mostly common or easily overwritten um, into the pilot app.cfg file that are common across those eight. That way we don't have to keep duplicating those same few lines of uh, parameters in all of our uh, sort of step specific uh, .cfg files. So step 02.cfg will be those parameters that are, that are specific to step two. 
That includes things like our output file names that we want to make sure they're different for each uh, simulation. And generally our, our, uh, our fault conditions, because we're going to do a lot of different things um, with a fault, and they vary between steps one through eight. Uh, so we stick the fault information in step two. For material settings, as discussed in the manual, we're going to, for these suite of examples, we're either going to have all elastic material properties or uh, this combination of elastic and viscoelastic uh, properties. So instead of sort of repeating that information in sort of one or uh, in each file, we've basically grouped all of those material model parameters into two files. There's a mat underscore elastic.cfg, which is when all the material models are elastic, and a mat underscore viscoelastic.cfg for the case when we have uh, the combination of elastic and viscoelastic materials. And then our solver settings, we've uh, created uh, this solver field split.cfg. Those are um, solver parameters that work when we have a fault and uh, uses a relatively optimized solver for this type of elasticity problem. So now let's start looking at um, those files. So first, we'll start with pilotapp.cfg. Start at the very top. Uh, so um, as I discussed in the, in the refresher portion, uh, these .cfg files, anything beginning with a pound is a comment. So um, at the top, you'll see that the first heading we come to is pilot app.journal. And actually, if I change this from Python syntax highlighting to config, you can see that I now have syntax highlighting from my headers. Um, so journals are, when you run a pilot simulation, everything that's dumped to standard out, that's the stuff you see in the terminal window, is controlled by these journals. And so you can turn on uh, information uh, sort of component by component. So these are all lowercase, and it's the name of the component. So pilot app is the application, time dependent is the specific type of problem. And I'm just gonna, in this case, in the pilot app, Basically, for the variety of problems we're going to do, I'm turning on the main basic sort of output information. Um, so materials, both the types of faults, elasticity, mesh IO qubit, solver linear. And basically, that'll give us the status of um, what's going on in the simulation output. So one thing I would suggest you do in tinker time today, turn all, make all these zeros and see what happens. Um, and you can see how much output is um, given and then start turning some of these on one by one and see what information you get to get a feel for sort of how much information each of these contributes. So here next we have our mesh generator. So we need to read in that mesh file. So we need to specify the type of mesh that is being used. So mesh -O qubit, the file name, where you have our mesh in the mesh directory so it's mesh slash mesh dot underscore tet dot exo now qubit generates the mesh and the order of the cells and elements is the order it generated the cells and vertices now that may not be an optimal orient uh may not be an optimal numbering for the numerical solution and, and so we can use a renumbering algorithm called reverse cut hill mckee um, to reorder the mesh and what it does is it tries to number uh, cells that are that are in close proximity with consecutive uh, numbering as well as vertices in close proximity and what that does is that brings the information associated with the degrees of freedom in our linear solve so um, our matrix vector equation it brings those degrees of freedom to be closer in space to where they are in space and connectivity in the mesh. And so what that does is it shrinks our total memory use and it also speeds up the solve because instead of when it's doing the matrix vector uh, operations, uh, the degrees of freedom are close in memory um, because that's the way they're ordered. Um, so that'll reduce how much uh, so that it has to retrieve memory from outside of the cache. Now next, Remember, in our when we did the mesh, we geo-referenced the mesh. 
Um, so we used a geographic projection that is a transverse mercator. Uh, our horizontal datum is WGS84. Uh, our vertical datum is mean sea level. And then we use uh, PROJ4 parameters to specify the projection and the projection parameters. So T mark for transverse mercator. And then we're gonna put the origin uh, in the city of Portland. So longitude, that's where this, this is the longitude and latitude of the city of Portland. And then there's a scaling factor that is often used for transverse mercator. Um, space dimension three. So by specifying the actual georeference coordinate system here for the, that the mesh was in, it means we can use data elsewhere that is in a georeference coordinate system that is different. If we said here that we were using a Cartesian coordinate system, which is what the mesh was generated in, we'd have no georeferencing information and any data we bring in would have to be converted to that Cartesian grid. Pyloth will automatically do those conversions in bringing other information in if we give it the georeference projection. So our spatial databases, we can specify in a different georeference projection and Pyloth will do the automatic conversion between the two. So it's very useful if you're doing a problem that has a real place on the earth to use a geographic projection and be georeferenced. So we, uh, in the brief question and answer, we said we needed four materials, one for the slab, one for the wedge, one for the mantle, one for the crust. So here I've written the block numbers that we generated within the Qubit journal file um, to, for each of those four materials. So with those four materials, the first thing we do is we need, whoops, we need to create an array of four materials. Now, Pyloth is nice and it says, what would you like to name those materials? And we can give whatever name we want. It does not have to correspond to the name of the block. It can be just what we want in this simulation. And so uh, it's easiest to be consistent. So I name them slab, wedge, crust, and mantle. So now I put in the header for our slab and now we're gonna specify just the very basic material information that is uh, that corresponds to the mesh. We're not specifying the properties, we're not even specifying, specifying the type of material, but we're linking the information that has to be consistent based on the mesh. Um, and remember, we're in our pilot app.cfg file, these aren't specific to our given problem. They're just specific to the mesh. So my slab, I'm gonna give it a label. This label is used in error messages associated with that material. So I wanna differentiate that label, those labels should be unique across materials so that when you get an error message, you can go back and figure out uh, which material it's being associated with. Now this ID here, as uh, noted up here, corresponds to the block in uh, the, mesh, the Exodus mesh file. So for our slab, we'll use an ID of one. For our wedge, we'll use an ID of two. For the mantle, we'll use an ID of three. And the crust, we'll use an ID of four. We also need to specify the discretization information. So fiat is our finite element basis tabulator. Um, and if we're using triangles uh, or tetrahedra, uh, those fall into a simplex family. And so we use the fiat simplex type for our quadrature cell. And we're working in three dimensions. So we tell it that uh, our cell has uh, three dimensions. Now uh, within this quadrature, it may have multiple quadrature points. So when we do our numerical integration, uh, we uh, perform an integral by evaluating the basis functions at the quadrature points and summing those up. Now, Paraview doesn't understand if you have multiple quadrature points within a cell. It only knows how to display information when there's one point per cell. So Pilot has what we call a cell filter that will average the output over the quadrature points uh, and actually use the weights in the quadrature so it comes up with the actual average value within the cell um, before it writes information to the output. So that's what we will almost always use a cell filter average to average the information. And then we're gonna tell it the type of file we want um, by saying it's a data writer HDF5. It, mean, it will write the HDF5 and the corresponding XDMF file. Um, the default is the VTK ASCII, and so this gives us faster uh, output by writing to HDF5. It also makes it easy to access it from 
uh, Python or MATLAB. So we have relatively the same information for the wedge, mantle, and crust. Uh, you'll notice that the really only differences here are the label for the material that's used in the error messages as well as the ID that corresponds to the block number. Boundary conditions. Uh, remember, we decided we'd have five boundary conditions. They're all displacement, and we're going to set the degree of freedom perpendicular to the boundary to be zero. Um, and uh, by using the zero displacement spatial database, which is the default, we don't even need to specify a spatial database uh, to set the value on the displacement to zero. So the first thing we do for our boundary conditions is we create an array of five boundary conditions. Um, you can use things like east, north, south, um, and west. Instead, I often use the coordinate directions, so x negative, x positive, y negative, y positive, and z negative. Um, and so down here for x negative, this is a boundary where the normal is in the x direction. So in order to constrain the, the degree of freedom perpendicular to that boundary, I'm going to give it a degree of freedom of zero being constrained. I then tell it the node set in qubit. So instead of here, instead of using the value, the numerical value for that node set, I'm using the name. That's much easier um, to remember and makes it easier to see that it's consistent. So by using, and within qubit we gave on the x negative boundary, we said that we label that node set boundary x negative. So that's the label that I'm using here. The material blocks, even though we named the block, that block name was not written to the exodus file. That's name that they use internally in qubit, but they don't export it to the exodus file. And so we don't have access to that information from pilot. So that's why for the blocks, we have to use numbers, whereas node sets, we can actually use names. Um, and then we're gonna give the, uh, the database underscore initial is a, that's the zero displacement uh, boundary condition by default. And so our label is uh, that we're going to give for that uh, database is Dursley boundary condition on minus X. If the, again, this is for error messages that'll, because we'll have lots of spatial databases, if a spatial beta database detects an error, we want it to tell us which spatial database had that error so we can come in and correct uh, what the issue was. So X positive, also want to constrain the X degree of freedom. Y negative and Y positive to constrain the Y degree of freedom. And Z negative, two means correspond, constrain the Z degree of freedom. For output, we are going to output uh, over the domain and then we'll output the ground surface. So uh, in almost all simulations, we'll want to output the ground surface. That's where we have observations. That's what we're used to looking at. Um, but it's also nice to occasionally, maybe at fewer time steps, output the solution over the domain. Um, in 2D, generally, we'll want the, the whole domain because that's, we're going to want information on that cross section. Although sometimes we may also write uh, the boundary, which is the ground, the ground surface curve as well. The default is output over the entire domain. So for our subdomain, we have to change its component type from being an output over the entire domain to be an output over a uh, bounding surface or solution subset. So that's what we're doing here is we're taking, we're saying for my subdomain, create, uh, use the component that's the output, that's the subset of the solution. Then for my domain, uh, I tell it to use the HDF5 writer. For my subdomain, I tell it to use the HDF5 writer. And I want to tell it the node set that corresponds to the boundary where I want the output. So ground surface or the top level surface over the entire domain, that was our boundary Z positive uh, node set. So boundary Z pause um, for the label. Finally, I'm gonna give it basic solver parameters for all of our simulations. I want it to, if it, uh, does, if it doesn't free all the memory that it used, I want it to tell us because that would mean we'd have a memory leak. So this is primarily a debugging, internal debugging thing for Pyleth. We're gonna use a direct solver. So our preconditioner uh, is LU. This will use, this will be slow, It'll take a lot of memory, um, but it's uh, the most robust solver that you can use. So 
Matt's suggestion is always start with LU and then fine tune as you uh, um, move forward and understand your, the physics of your problem as well as that you know that the solution converges. Um, if it doesn't converge for a direct solve, it means you've set up the problem incorrectly. Some of the other solvers, it may be fine tuning the solver parameters. Um, so always starting with sort of the direct solve, um, simplest, fewest parameters uh, is a good place to start. Our, we're gonna do mostly linear solves. So our relative tolerance is 10 to the minus 10. That means whatever residual it started with, once that residual has been reduced by uh, um, 10 orders of magnitude, we'll let the linear solve converge. Um, and if, if that residual ever drops below 10 to the minus 11, we'll, let it we'll tell it to converge. We tell it to do the maximum number of iterations at 500, and um, every 50 iterations, it'll restart our uh, orthogonalization of the search directions. Um, we'll tell it that we want to monitor the tolerance that it spits out at every, every iteration. We're not, we have commented out viewing the solver. So it's actually, if we turn this on, it'll actually spit out at every iteration, the solver, uh, sort of the type of solver it's using, the type of preconditioner, the number of non-zeros, how many columns in the matrix and so forth. However, we do want us to tell, out, tell us why it thinks it converged. And then if it doesn't converge to trigger an error. If you turn this off and or don't set this, the Petsy solver will continue to just turn and the simulation will continue to proceed for additional time steps after you failed to converge. Once you failed to converge, generally you're only generating heat. You're not doing anything useful and you're, you're, the values are, are in most cases uh, meaningless. However, sometimes you may wanna sort of see, well, what did the solution not converge to? So in that case, you may wanna turn it off, but then stop the simulation at that time step and, and by telling it don't uh, simulate a longer time uh, than that. Um, Nonlinear solvers generally are, are look the same. And then we'll view a log summary. So at the end of the simulation, Petsy will spit out a log summary saying, this is how long it took. This is the time I spent doing these various things. Here's uh, all of the, here's how Petsy was compiled and all sorts of information. Um, generally, it's the performance information of how long it took um, and how much time it spent in each of the various stages that we really look at. You know, how much time was it spending on the solve compared to just reading in the mesh? Ideally, once you go to large problems, we want most of the time to be spent in the solve um, and that being a reasonable amount of time so that uh, we actually get results um, in a reasonable uh, time frame. Are there any questions about sort of the basic parameter file? Yes. No, so these are, we are solving a linear system. A matrix times a vector equals another vector. So at each iteration, using these iterative methods that scale well in parallel, we will look at whether our solution, how well it satisfies that equation. We'll end up with a residual. The norm of that residual is compared against these tolerances. And these tolerances are not the true residual, these are the preconditioned residual which is using the preconditioned version of that uh, A matrix. You can turn on view true residual and it'll spit out the preconditioned residual as well as the true residual. Sometimes if things go wrong, those may be orders of magnitude difference. And that's telling you that your preconditioning is not suited for the particular type of problem. So, uh, good point. How should we base our solver tolerances? So these tolerances are in non-dimensional space. These are internal in, in, in the actual solve. So if we have, uh, and the default, I didn't mention that, that um, the default length scale for non-dimensionalization is a kilometer. The default time scale is a year. So, our displacements, are, if our displacements are on the order of a kilometer, they'll be a sort of order one. If our displacements are on the order of meter, they'll be 10 to the minus three. 
So when you think about uh, sort of deformation, um, as we get out near our boundaries, maybe we're looking at a millimeter of deformation. Um, and uh, so our length scale is a kilometer, millimeter divided by a kilometer at 10 to the minus six. So yeah, we're five orders of magnitude less than that. Um, and, but uh, so the question is, you know, what are our, obs what's the sort of accuracy of our observations? How much deformation? And so usually I would go a couple or at least a couple orders of magnitude smaller than the accuracy that I want in my uh, solution. Um, 10 to the minus 11 is a little bit of overkill. Um, 10 to the minus eight is probably a little closer to the order that you want. Um, and also you'll notice that when we'll look at the solve and we'll see how fast it's converging, sometimes a couple, if the solver is working very well, a couple orders of magnitude in sort of the linear solver tolerance may only be two or three iterations difference. Uh, so at that point, it's not really not making that much a difference. Um, and so generally we're thinking of the order of, you know, a couple orders of magnitude may or may not make much difference. Once we start talking about some of the nonlinear, then uh, things become much more sensitive. Good. Right, so as I said, the default uh, spatial database for the Dirichlet boundary condition is a zero displacement spatial database, so it'll automatically populate with a value of zero by default. Okay, so let's move on to step, the actual step two file. So at the top here, we're telling you which parameter files the simulation is using. We also tell you right here how to run the simulation. So if you're not reading the manual, at least look at the top of the .cfg file. Um, I strongly recommend that once you start creating your own .cfg files, that you document somewhere in that directory how you ran and what combination of .cfg files you use to generate each simulation. Um, the pilot parameter file, Pyre handles collecting all that information. It also, you know, if you use command line arguments to, to sort of fine tune things and don't include them in .cfg file, that's another thing to document. The output of that pilot parameters JSON file is the collection of all of that. It will tell you which file it came from and which parameter it used, but it, it will not reverse engineer those files for you. Um, so the first thing we do is tell it where we want to generate, where we want it to dump that JSON parameter file. So we'll dump all our output to the output directory. We'll begin every, all of our output files with the step 02. So for our parameters, it's step 02 dash parameters. The progress file, this is the file that will tell us how far it's gotten and how, when it expects the simulation to be done. We'll be in step 02-progress.txt. We then begin uh, to define our problem. So uh, our time stepper wants the total time. We can give, we use units here, so 200 times year. Notice it's not YR or years, it's year. So you give it, it and it won't be days or, yes, days. There is no month because months are a different length, but you can use year, you can use second, you can use S for second, you can use day. Um, 
And then for DT, our time step, as we said, we chose 200 years and 10 years for the time step. So that's specifying those parameters. Now we're gonna uh, give it our fault patch information. So first we have to define how many faults we have. We said we're gonna have one, just the top of the slab. So our interfaces array contains just one. Um, here I've called it slab. So notice I have named a component slab that's for the material. I've also <laughs> named a component slab for the fault. Um, maybe not the wisest thing to do, but because they know each have different parent components, it doesn't matter. Uh, we tell it what type of interface, so we're gonna prescribe the slip. So that fault type is fault cohesive kin, kinematic being different than dynamic. So kinematic means prescribed slip, dynamic means spontaneous rupture. Uh, so our faults, we remember we have, it's buried in the middle of the domain, so the entire node set for the entire fault surface is fault underscore slab top underscore patch. We then have the three sides that are buried in the domain. That's the edge node set. And so that's fault underscore slab top underscore patch underscore edge. Uh, we then have the quadrature or basis scheme for our fault. Again, we're using triangles on our fault because we have a tetrahedral mesh. That's the, the simplex family. And now we're one dimension down from uh, in topology from the domain. So instead of a value of three, our fault is a surface. So that means 2D for two for the dimension. Our slip time function, we're gonna, uh, uh, our slip time function with a, that's a step function has two parameters, the final value of slip and the time at which that slip occurs. Now those can be spatially varying. In this case, when I said our, what our problem description was, I said we're gonna use a uniform uh, slip on the fault. So the easiest for uniform slip is a uniform spatial database. I can specify the values right here in the parameter file. I give it a name, so a final slip label that'll be used in error messages, and then the three components of slip. So within the plane of the fault, I have lateral motion and reverse slip, as well as fault opening. Um, so I'm gonna give it minus one of left lateral slip. That means one meter of right lateral slip, and then four meters of reverse slip. Uh, if it was negative, then it'd be slip in the normal direction. For the slip time, I said we wanted the whole fault to slip at 10 years. So um, we're gonna give it a slip initiation time of 9.999 uh, years. Uh, now, when I remember I said that everything is non-dimensionalized, um, within Pilot, you can end up with small round off errors. If I really want something to happen at 10.0 years, um, it's best to sort of say in the parameter file, specify it's 10 years minus epsilon, um, where epsilon is much less than the time step. That way I know something will happen at uh, the time step of 10 years. Um, so that's why I give it 9.999, um, because it actually takes that value, multiplies it by the number of seconds in the year, and then divides that by uh, the time scale. Um, and so you'll notice that, you know, there's times 10 to the seventh seconds in a year. So I'm gonna multiply some value by 10 to the seventh, divide by 10 to the seventh. Once those numbers start to get big, you can sort of have some round off issues. And that's why I use uh, the time I want minus epsilon. And then for the output, again, for the fault, I'll also use the data uh, HDF5 writer, give it the file name. And then now in the info, this is the sort of diagnostic information. This isn't part of the solution. This is sort of what it writes after it's done initialization, I want it to see the orientation of the fault. So I ask it to spit out the normal direction for the fault, the strike direction and the dip direction. I'll also ask it to, to spit out the final slip. Um, that's the value from the uniform spatial database and the slip time of the rupture. So um, here I can make sure if I have a very complicated spatial database and spatial variation of the parameters, I can use this inf diagnostic information to look and make sure that the distribution of slip on the fault is what I think I am putting in the spatial database. Then the rest of the output for the domain and subdomain, here I, I'm just specifying the file names um, for all of those components, which are specific to step 02. Any questions on uh, 
this one. Yes. So, uh, the slip time and final slip section of the code says slip value equals and then an array. Are those like commands that have been recommended or are they just names that are in your application? And so, um, so all each line, so you'll notice that these lines are under this heading. So that is important. It means that these values correspond to that particular component. So I'm specifying the parameters for that component. Now within that, I can put, it doesn't care whether I specify slip time first or slip first. Ordered in that sense doesn't matter. Now these are arrays. These are just the values it wants to look up for when it's doing the initialization. So this, the order of these values is, um, is not, uh, the order does not matter for these values. Um, just make sure that the order here matches the, has to be consistent with the order of the next line. The names of these values are based on the parameters of my slip function. So different slip func, generally the, in 2D, generally in 3D, the, the, the slip values it's looking for are going to be all the same. They're always going to be left lateral slip, reverse slip, and fall opening. In 2D, it's just lateral, in 2D, it's just left lateral slip because that works whether I have a dipping fault or a strike slip fault and I'm looking at it in plane. Um, the slip time, this slip time parameter is specific to the, uh, the heavy sided, heavy sided step function, slip time function. Well, this is the database. This is a uniform database. Right. Um, so that's, so I was also going to show that I can map this elastic. So here I'm specifying, remember this parameter file is specifying for my four materials, what type of material I want, that's the constitutive behavior, and then the parameters for that constitutive model. So I've already created my array of four materials, wedge, crust, slab, and mantle. So the first thing I do is specify what material type I want for each of those uh, materials. So for the wedge and crust, I'm gonna use an elastic material. In 3D, that's elastic isotropic 3D, that's the name. For the slab and mantle, I want a linear Maxwell model. So in 3D, that's Maxwell isotropic 3D. In 2D, these would be elastic plane strain and Maxwell plane strain. For the slab, uh, I'm going to give it, um, I'm going to separate the elastic properties from the viscoelastic properties. Remember, I there's another model, there's another parameter file called mat underscore elastic dot CFG that then it uses its own set of spatial databases for the elastic properties. Now, oftentimes we'll be given elastic properties, say from a seismic velocity model, but we won't be given the viscoelastic properties. We may, some of those uh, properties may, like the elastic properties, we may understand the 3D variation of those material properties, but we only understand the depth dependence of the viscosity. So using separate spatial databases, I can specify the elastic properties in whatever spatial database I want, and then the viscoelastic properties in another one. So a composite database allows me to merge the information from the elastic spatial database with the information from the viscoelastic database uh, to create all of the properties I need for the, the viscoelastic material. So I do that. And uh, so uh, for a composite database, it has subcomponents database A and database B. Um, and so database A, I'm gonna use for my elastic properties. So I tell it which properties to find in spatial database A. When it's looking for the density, it'll say, oh, I need to query the this, this spatial database A for that. Um, when I look for viscosity, I will query spatial database B. Um, for the uh, database A, my elastic properties, I have a single point in a simple spatial database. Um, and I could have used a uniform database and done it right here in the code, but because I'm using this across simulations, I decided I would put them in a separate uh, 
uh, file. And so that file is mat slab for the slab. It's mat underscore slab underscore elastic dot spatial DB. Um, so quickly, I will bring that up. Mat elastic, mat slab elastic spatial DB. So that at the top, you'll see that this is a simple DB. This is just a, mastic, a magic header line. I tell it the number of values for the material properties, give the names. So you need to, you'll see this is a little bit more verbose than what I had for a uniform database. Um, and in particular here, because I'm gonna give it in, uh, give coordinates for points, I need to say what coordinate system I'm using. And I'm going to use the same coordinate system as my mesh for simplicity. Um, and so I say, I repeat sort of, this is sort of the spatial database version of those parameters that I had in the pilotapp.cfg file. So I'm giving it the ellipsoid, um, which I didn't give in the other file, but I think the default is WGS84. I give it the same vertical datum. Um, and then uh, you can do a local rotation coordinate system. Um, instead, I just give it all the projection options down here at the bottom. And then this simple spatial database has just one point, so uniform, X, Y, Z, and then density, uh, shear wave speed in kilometers per second, and P wave speed in kilometers per second. So notice up here I gave my units, whatever units I use up here are the units used for all the values in the spatial database. These columns, these are just comments. So, you know, if you change your units here and change them here, make sure you also change them up here, which is actually being read by the file. So, okay, that's this file. Now let's look at the, uh, we're gonna use, uh, uh, for the viscosity, we're gonna put in a depth dependence and a simple spatial database. It doesn't make any assumptions about how the points are ordered in the database. Um, so it has to basically find the nearest point, find the two points a point is between, and do linear interpolation. A simple grid database, the points, uh, we tell it what coordinates we're gonna use as a function of depth. It will, as it reads, the coordinates can be specified in any order in the same file, and then uh, the spatial data, database will automatically order them based on the coordinates that were given um, in terms of uh, at the top of the file, which I'll show you. And then it can use a bilinear search to very quickly zero in exactly where uh, the grid point is just based on the coordinate that it's looking for. And it can do that in to the depth independently of the horizontal direction. So that's, as I mentioned before, it's much uh, faster and more efficient. So let's look at Matt. Yeah. So we populate uh, the material properties on a quadrature point by quadrature point basis. So if, our mat if, our, if there's a linear variation, uh, we will go to, we will look up the material properties at each uh, point, at each, the location of each quadrature point. Um, and so to the extent that that gives us the best representation of the variation of materials within the cell. Um, So this is our uh, viscosity variation. So remember, we have the slab and the mantle. The slab goes all the way to the ground surface. So to impose basically elastic deformation near the top of the slab, I'm gonna give it a very long Maxwell time. So my depth dependence will be at zero. I'll give it a Maxwell time of 10,000 years. 
up to 20 kilometers, 5,000 years. Then, then down, once I get to 30 kilometers, I'll start cutting down um, the Maxwell time to something that's actually will relax over the time scale of the simulation. So 20, 200 years, 100 years, and then at the very bottom, 50 years. Um, and so the Maxwell time is viscosity over the bulk uh, modulus. Um, and so what I did is I looked at what the bulk modulus was, uh, what the Maxwell time I wanted, and then came up with a viscosity. So in our simple grid database, rather than giving the number of locations, for each coordinate dimension, we give the number of points. So with just a depth variation, we have one point along X, one point along Y, and then five points along Z. We're only including one value in the spatial database, uh, viscosity, again, our geographic projection. So X coordinate is zero, Y coordinate zero, Z coordinates, I'm gonna, so I'm saying that I'm gonna use this depth variation, so I'll give it, I'll have points at zero, minus 20, minus 30, minus 100, and minus 400. So those are the values I give here. They must be in order so that my bilineal search will actually work. So it needs to start from my smallest value and then increase. And then I can give my grid of points here, this is only along a line, but I can give these in any order and it'll look up and say, oh, you gave me a value of zero for Z, so I know that that index for that Z component must be zero um, and so forth. So in some t sometimes I may have a grid in X and Y or Y and Z or X and Z or X, Y and Z. Um, and so down here, there's flexibility in the order of these points. This makes converting a seismic velocity model that you're given in some uh, weird uh, logically regular grid but may have irregularly spaced points um, and may the points may be in a different order that than what you want um, you can as long as you give it the array of coordinates in the right order um, up here that those are sorted down here at the bottom when you're actually just giving the value of the points the x y z and value they can be in, in any order um, that you want one thing to uh, to note is that you always must end your spatial databases with a line feed. So make sure that after you have put your last line of data that you actually do have a end of line character there um, coming down here. Otherwise it won't read in that last line of data. That's a common problem. People get error reading spatial database and they see, well, my file looks like it has all the information. Um, what's the problem? Um, so that's the viscoelastic. So let's go back. Yep. Can you speak up? Yeah, so um, I just, I made this variation up sort of independent of the discretization size. Obviously, if I told it to make a big jump over a distance that was much smaller than my cell size, I would see a discontinuity in the, in the viscosity. If I, likewise, if I have a discretization size of say 100 meters and I enforce a variation that's uh, you know, much longer than that, then my, uh, the simulation will actually capture that spatial variation. So there is, some correspondence here between the length scale of my spatial variations and my and the grid size. So it doesn't, you know, if you had a very high resolution profile that you were specifying the viscosity as a function of depth every 10 meters, you know, grid cell size, I think would we use 20 kilometers, it's not going to see all those spatial variations. Um, it's just going to use the point. It's going to say, here's my quadrature point. What was that? And you're your spatial database could be severely aliased. Um, so I think, so we finished looking over all of our input files. So I think we're ready to run pilots. So we didn't, oh, sorry, we didn't look at the solver file. So I'll just quickly show you what the solver looks like. So in this case, you know, even though our pilot app.cfg file used the direct solver, we're going to use something that's a little more optimized. Um, this is the solver that is discussed and recommended in our 2013 JGR paper.
um, you'll see that uh, it has the, uh, for the formulation, we're splitting fields, we're giving it a matrix type AIJ, that's, we're, because we're gonna use algebraic multi-grid, we're no longer gonna have a, a symmetric sparse matrix. So we have to switch from the default of a symmetric sparse matrix to a non-symmetric and tell it to use the custom pre constraint preconditioner for the faults. And then within the field split, um, it uses sort of the algebraic multi-grid is specified here. Um, and you can, uh, if you wanna know more detailed information about specifically why we chose these parameters, you can read the JGR paper, talk to Matt. Um, and get the lowdown and you can, in our JGR paper, we compared several solvers and this one didn't always give the fewest iterations, but the iterations were computed faster. And so it actually was the, in terms of total runtime was faster um, than all the other preconditioners that we've tried. Um, so now we're ready to run. So let's bring up our terminal window, come back. So, oops. Uh, let's, I think I forgot to, yes. So I am starting from this, from scratch in this terminal window. I have not even run source. Let's see, did I at least set the, nope, I didn't even, oh, I did set the path right. So I did do something, but I'm not even in the right directory. So I need to go to the source examples, 3D subduction. Now, if I run, Let's make sure, yes, that's right. Um, and I don't, in my mesh, I don't have the Exodus file there, so I'll show you what happens if you try and run this without the mesh file. Oh, sorry. And it didn't like my underscores. So first message I get my mesh underscore mesh dot t tet dot exo file was not there, but I know where to find it. So you can always just deny that, that's a firewall uh, thing. So you'll, you'll see it's spitting out a lot of information, integrating Jacobian operator, that's the sparse matrix. Now I'm solving equations. This is a, that was a warning from the algebraic multi, uh, algebraic multi-grid preconditioner. Here I'm solving, uh, so you can see my residual starting out about 10 to the minus four, um, going down to 10 minus 12. It's taking on the order of, uh, I can't read fast enough. Uh, <laughs> I think 40 something, high 30s, low 40s for the number of iterates. Um, and it's time stepping. And you'll see that the output it's saying, I am going from so many seconds to so many seconds uh, in time. Um, so this is running the simulation time stepping. It's generating the output to the output directory. Uh, And so while it's doing this, um, so we did not, to sort of get an idea of um, the parameters that are available, let's look at the actual parameter file that's generated. So, So here's my step two JSON parameter file. 
So let's see. Well, it, the question we came up was about our boundary conditions. So if we look at, say, our boundary condition here, you'll see that uh, I have, here's my full path application problem. My application is always pilot app. Um, problem B, C, Y negative. Um, degree of freedom being constrained is one. It was constrained in the pilot app.cfg file, line 153. Um, the label is Y negative uh, for my, there's a bunch of null components here, meaning they weren't specified. Database initial configured as zero displacement uh, DB and uh, set from default. So that's telling you that the spatial database for the initial value of our time dependent Dirichlet boundary condition, um, the default is a zero displacement database. All of the other parameters for that time dependence are null, meaning they're not gonna be used. Um, so this is a way that uh, you'll see in the discussion of the time dependence in the manual how there's sort of a functional form that you can give spatial database uh, and this version of Pyleth with uh, in different parameters for that spatial database. Um, and if you don't include it, then that term is not included um, in the solution. So let's see where we are in Pyleth. Okay, so Pyleth ran. This is that log file telling you all sorts of information that was used, how long we spent in So these are all of the different functions that get called and that have login information finally up here at the top. So this is where we actually ended the simulation. Here's our log performance summary. So it took 80 seconds. Um, we were getting uh, 9.8 uh, flops per second. It used uh, in bytes, seven times 10 to the eighth bytes. Um, it, uh, there was some MPI reductions. Main stage, that's sort of the, uh, where we actually, we sort of the meshing stage took 2.5 seconds, set up 5.6, reforming the Jacobian 3.7, reforming the residual 3.9. Most of our pen time, 68 0.9% of the time was spent in the solve. That's good. Um, Pre-step was 2%. Actual step that's outside of the solve was 0.2%. Post-step output took about 9.3%. So our output, we were doing enough output um, that that took a little while. Writing, if we eliminate our output over the domain, our output of the state variables, you can really get that down if those aren't things um, that you want. Um, This is, so this was all written to standard out. So normally what I do is I capture, I would, I would do something like capture standard out and standard to the same file, run it in the background. Um, and then the next line I would maybe, you know, every once in a while run the tail command to sort of see where it is um, in the simulation. Nonlinear solver actually run grep on the, on, to see how many time steps it's done um, and where, whether, like how many iterations it was taking at each uh, time step. Um, okay, so let's visualize this data. Um, and so um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run pair view. Now then our output files are HDF5 files and we wanna, we don't load the HDF5 file, we actually load the XDMF file, which has the metadata that tells pair view where to find the information that it uses. Our HDF5 files, you can structure them in sort of arbitrarily different ways. Um, it's a free form sort of format that conforms to a specific binary sort of specification, but the data can be organized and labeled differently. Um, so what we do is the XDMF file is what Pairview uses to sort of give it the organization of the HDF5 file. Um, so let me, I sh first let's go to output and I will show you what one of these guys looks like. So the XMF file is an XML file. And basically this all just has pointers to say, uh, heavy data is, means the HDF5. And it says, use the data set cell fields total strain um, to find the information about say total strain ZZ. So my tensors, I can actually give it information about uh, the components of the tensor um, and how to split them out. 
um, so that when I load it up in Paraview, I know which uh, components are there um, and the order of the components for things like strain and stress and strain. Um, and at the very top of this file, uh, it, well, let's see. So at the very top of the file, I give information about the topology, the cells topology. That's how the vertices are connected into cells and then the coordinates of the vertices. Um, and then I can run things like HDF5 dump. Let's see, for the same file, I can tell. So HDF5 dump is a, um, It's a HDF5 utility that's included in the binary distribution and the HDF5 library. And so to, it tells me the organization of the HDF5 file that I have these groups, data sets. It's sort of structured like you would a Unix file system and that you can think of data sets being in directories which are labeled groups in the HDF5 and so forth. Um, so the information I have here in this file is stress, total strain, look, according to the vertices, the time, those are the timestamps and topology of the cells. Um, and so let's go now then when I invoke Paraview because HDF5 has a relative link to my uh, HDF5 file, I need to run Paraview from the directory where I ran PyLift. So on my machine, Paraview is installed in this location. Um, and I'm gonna run uh, I'm going to show you sort of a shortcut here. Uh, I have scripts in the viz directory that I just plus displacement warp that, uh, so I have created a Python script that will automatically load up a file and uh, assemble sort of a warping of the image by a certain factor. Uh, Oops. So the default in that script is step zero three. So let's change that to step zero two. That's another advantage of uh, running from the command line. So it is loaded. It has done a warp by vector. It's added an annotation of the time. So these are sort of repetitive visualizations that take about 20 clicks to do. It's very useful to put them all in a Python script that you can then just run using the dash dash script equals. And I can still now interact with it. If you try and run that script directly, and I'll refer you to the manual on how to do that, you end up with a window that does not have any controls. It's just a, 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 a empty window that you can rotate uh, the object in. Whereas here, I have the animation controls that I can play forward in time, and it'll step through all the time steps showing the deformation. And first I need to select rescale for the sort of final time step. So you can see I've, uh, this is above my uh, fault patch. I had uniform slip. You can see I have very uniform deformation except at the edges of the fault. Um, it's been exaggerated by a factor of 10,000. Um, so it's, you can see it's uh, at the top of the, the trench, it's greatly exaggerated this offset. Um, and I have the original mesh shown in gray. Uh, so it's undeformed and then I have the deformed mesh shown uh, in color. I can change the displacement component being visualized. So that's the north-south component, vertical component there. You can uh, set these, rescale the color scale so it's symmetric. So you can have, you know, uh, red and blue for positive and negative and so forth. Yes. In this case, they are taken directly. And so I added the label in my Python script. I knew that I was using S, that it would be output in SI units. So, and I didn't scale it. So I added the meters uh, 
annotation. Same thing with the years. It was the time stamps in the file are given in seconds. And so I divided by the number of seconds in a year when I uh, did my annotation time filter. That's the filter in the annotation time is it allows me to sort of to specify the format and uh, the value um, for that timestamp. Um, 